Hello, and welcome to WWF Canada's Wildlife Wednesday. No matter whether you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter, we're just so happy you could join us for this special Wildlife Wednesday, our last Wildlife Wednesday before the holidays with a special winter theme. My name is Megan Leslie. I'm president and CEO of WWF Canada, and I love working at WWF Canada. I love it because I get to learn so much about wildlife in Canada, from narwhal to beavers to cardinals. And I love it because I get to work with the most amazing people. I mean, everybody who works here loves wildlife and nature. But you know, some people who work here have some very specialized knowledge that's super fun to ask them about. And one of those people is joining us today, Steve Hamill. Steve is an expert in biodiversity or the plants and animals in towns and cities. Um, and Steve, I really wanna welcome you to WWF Wildlife Wednesday. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, thank you, Megan. So I'm Steve and I've been working as a field biologist for over 25 years now. And now I'm working at the WWF as the urban biodiversity uh, specialist. And uh, I work on different conservation projects to help the wildlife sur survive in urban environment. And today I want to talk about five different species of birds and four different species of mammals. So they all share different strategies to survive the winter. And I want to talk about those with you. Okay, great. Well, let's get started. It is a pretty exciting episode today. And like I said, it's our last episode before the holidays, and it's also our winter special. So we'll be exploring some topics and questions that I think a lot of us in Canada think about, especially those of us in urban areas. Now, I used to live in the city of Halifax. Now I live in Toronto. Steve, you're in Montreal. And I'd like to know how urban wildlife in Canada prepare for winter because it's getting cold out there. So, you know, I've got my, I've got my mittens, <laughs> which I've got on backwards. <laughs> I've got my, my hat and my scarf. And another strategy that I use, Steve, I love, I don't know if you can tell what this is, I love a hot water bottle, filling this up and getting the bed all cozy. But I know that there aren't a lot of animals out there with mittens or hot water bottles. So um, tell me about some of the interesting and probably adorable species that we're going to talk about today. Sure, I have to agree with you. We have many ways of dealing with the cold, but personally, I would say that some species uh, have some interesting way to survive the winter. So, and it's a little more impressive than what we do, I think. So mm -hmm. for example, some, uh, some animals put a lot of work before the cold days arrive, and other have unique metabolic uh, system that allow them to uh, conserve energy while there's less food available. Uh, so I want to share you with all of you here some uh, interesting information, and I will be talking about a variety of urban wildlife, including skunks, peregrine falcon that we see here, the woodchuck, raccoon, snowy owl, black cap, chickadees, and downy woodpecker and ganadagi. So it's a lot, uh, but to make this information a bit easier to digest, I've uh, divided these urban species into three different classes of uh, wintering strategies, if we want. So the first strategy, the first class of the strategies is the hibernation one. The class number two is the migration strategy and then the business as usual strategy. Okay, hibernation, migration, yes. business as usual. I'm looking yes. forward to it. It sounds interesting and it sounds like we have a lot to cover. So yes. um, quickly before we jump in, I wanna remind people at home, Put your questions and comments in the chat box as we go along because we'll be doing a question and answer segment later on in the episode. We want all of your questions and hot tip. Uh, we're also going to be playing a round of trivia at the end of the episode. So make sure you're paying attention because I'm pretty sure Steve's going to sprinkle some of the answers into uh, to those questions throughout the episode. So uh, let's get started. Steve, we'll dive into that first group of species. Now to go back to that list, first was hibernation. So exactly, hibernation. There's actually two kinds of hibernation. There's the true hibernation and the a light version of hibernation. The true hibernation is the woodchuck that we have in our urban parks and urban cemetery where they spend the winter in their den. Uh, I say true hibernation because actually they have a uh, metabolic system that they can uh, allow them to have um, down to five heartbeats per minute. So it's a very wow. low... Yeah, amazing. And they can have the 
uh, body temperature goes as low as five Celsius. So it's a way for them to keep energy and they can live on their fat reserve for like five or six months. Uh, five from, heartbeats a minute. Yeah, so that's oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. And in our urban uh, cities, it's the woodchuck is the best example of that, uh, mm -hmm. uh, using that strategy. The light hibernation one, it's uh, the species like the skunk and the raccoon, they don't truly hibernate because their body the temperature don't go as low as five. Um, like the raccoon, when the raccoon, actually we can see raccoons all winter long, but when it's very cold, you'll see the raccoon going back in his den and will he will stay inactive for many weeks but not sleeping but just inactive the body temperature stay the same and heartbeat doesn't go as low as the woodchuck and so they keep energy like this so it's not true hibernation because there's not the physiological physiological system right. but uh, they just stay inactive the skunk it's a bit different mm -hmm. um the skunk will go in its den, will close the door with branches and dry leaves, and they can gather up to 20 all together in the same den to keep, uh, like the hot, hot water bottle you have, <laughs> and to keep the, the warm high in the den. So they will stay all together in the den for many weeks. And uh, so, and they actually, the heartbeat um, can go a little lower and the body temperature can go a little like two or three degree lower no more than that so it's not true hibernation it's light hibernation wow and 20 skunks in one den you don't want to come on that by surprise that's for sure <laughs> no, <not. laughs> so that's hibernation the other one you said um actually a lot of people do this they they go south for the winter they go somewhere warm tell us about migration Absolutely. When I think about migration, I think about the Canada goose that mm. breed in the high Arctic and fly down in south in the U.S. somewhere for the winter. But I'm talking here about the population that we have in our urban center. So every summer we see Canada geese everywhere um, breeding. And actually those population, they migrate to not as far as the high Arctic uh, population, but uh, they might, let's say, if we have uh, Canada geese breeding in Montreal, actually in, in fall, they will move to Toronto because winters over there are milder. So if you're in Toronto, you see a gaggle of geese coming from the east, the chances are good that they are from Montreal. <laughs> We can say so, bonjour. Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> speak French for sure. And um, so it's interesting to see they have short migration. Yeah. Um, the other species that is uh, I want to talk about is the snowy owl. Mm -hmm. So snowy owls spend the winter here, and they don't migrate from southern Canada to, to the U.S. They just actually migrate from the high Arctic, and they come here. So. All is relative, and uh, we can see snowy owl in the urban just surrounding our uh, big cities like Montreal, Winnipeg, Toronto. They are good uh, rodent habitat, and rodents are food for them. Right. So, when you drive around big cities, always look at the highway lamps and perching on it. The chances are good to see the snowy owl, and so we see a snowy owl in that urban setting. I've and never seen one on a highway lamp. That's so you said it, it, you can often see them there. Wow. Yeah. So if you're not driving a car in yeah. your highway <laughs> and going out, just look and uh, I'm sure you will find. And this, I heard that this year it's a good year to see them. Okay. So open your eyes and for sure. Yeah, thanks. And uh, actually, they have a, gr a great adaptation. Uh, you know, when it's minus 40 outside, if you put a thermometer by the skin, for mm -hmm. them, it's plus 25 Celsius. So oh. they are well at that for the cold. Yeah. For uh, the last species I, I want to talk about in that migration group is the chickadee, uh, the black-capped chickadee. Last, uh, I never thought I would talk about the chickadee saying that's a migrating species. I thought I was a it was a resident species I could see all summer long and then all winter long the same chickadees, but actually they migrate. So the chickadee you see in winter uh, could not be the same as you saw during the summer. So um, uh, let's add you bird feeder. Uh, last week in Montreal at the bird banding station, they catch um, one black capped chickadee who has been previously uh, banded in Quebec mm -hmm. City four weeks before that. So it's quite right. interesting to see that little bird follow uh, the north shore of the St. Lawrence down to Montreal. And uh, so it's migrating where it's warmer. Mm -hmm. And 
So I guess by now that little bird must be somewhere in Toronto, maybe if he kept following. <laughs> well, he's very welcome here because they're adorable. Um, so that's hibernating and migrating. Now yeah. there are there's definitely wildlife where it's just like, hey, winter's no big deal. What about those guys? Yeah. So the business as usual group. Um, so. The first piece I want to talk about is uh, the downy woodpecker. The downy woodpecker is a small woodpecker, black and white, that uh, we associate to forest very often. But when we do bird survey in urban area, we uh, notice that that species is, is quite uh, common in the winter because mm -hmm. they need trees. Even if it's not forest, as long as there are many trees in the urban setting, you will see down woodpeckers. So you have to open your eyes because they don't make noise in the winter. They spend their time foraging for uh, for foods, the larvae and insects, and they don't have time for drumming on the trees and making noise. So open your eyes and you will see a downy woodpecker. So okay. it's actually very common. Little black uh, and white ones, okay. Absolutely. And the uh, obvious species that is business as usual is the gray squirrel. The gray squirrel is active all winter long, mm -hmm. and uh, we see them even if, when it's very cold. And actually, if we have uh, many, many days in a row that they are cold, mm -hmm. the squirrel will go in his den to survive and actually will sleep, uses big bushy tail as a blanket. And um, oh. Uh, the, yeah, that's that. It seems so comfortable, yeah. and um, so it's a strategy they have to survive. So they'll stay inactive for a few days, and when it's a little warmer, they come out to get some food, uh, to forage for food. And uh, if the winter is very, very, uh, very cold, actually they will start mating uh, at the end of winter, beginning of spring, and they they have a, a litter, litter. So they have babies in the spring. But if the winter is milder. Uh, so they have, they can have up to two liters a year. So it means they would have enough food and so enough energy to have many babies during the year. Depending on the weather. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And the last species I want to talk about is the most iconic species. This is the peregrine falcon we see here on the video. Mm -hmm. um, that bird to survive winter will mainly hunt pigeon and um, the rock dove and actually eating those birds, uh, the falcon will keep his metabolism high to keep warm. Mm -hmm. And so when it's windy and cold, it will hide. But um, because it's a business as usual, right in the February 14th, I don't know why, they will start mating. And so- <laughs> It's a romantic day, Steve. Absolutely. Oh, that's why, okay. <laughs> and actually pretty, uh, every big cities in, in Canada, uh, they have at least one breeding pair of that species. We have them in Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal. And um, if it's not on a building, they will have a, a nest on the big bridges. So it's a quite common species again. Okay. So, Well, that's, I, I learned a lot about the different strategies of wildlife in winter. I really appreciate that. I know I'm not going to look at chickadees the same way because I really thought the ones at my feeder right now were the same ones that I saw this summer. So that's, uh, I, I learned a lot. Thank you. So now, Steve, we're going to move to um, question and answer time. And uh, you know what? You're going to be on the hot seat. It's like school exams all over again. Are you ready for this? Oh, yes. Okay, good. Uh, before I go to the questions in the comments, um, we have some awesome videos that some kids sent in. And we're going we're gonna to start with those. So I think first up, we have Kara. Hi, my name is Kara. This is my raccoon, Forest. I'm wondering about raccoons. Sometimes I see nests up in the trees. Do they live there? But my neighbors complain that they're under their deck. Do they live there? It's a, uh, that is a conundrum. Help uh, us out, Steve. Yeah, sure, that's a very good question. Actually, a raccoon, they really like to stay in trees uh, because wood is a good insulator. But for sure, they can use, uh, they, they can make bedens under any buildings, any houses. So they will use both, but they prefer the trees for sure. Okay, so so both answers are right. I, yeah. <laughs> that's good. It's always nice when both people are right. Thanks, Kara, for that question. Um, I know we also have a question from Milo. What's up, guys? And it's Milo James. I was doing research on the groundhog, and I learned that they lower their body temperature and their heart rate during hibernation. Why do they do that? 
great question. You know, Steve Milo is a big friend of WWF. He does a lot of fundraising for us and a lot of promotion of our uh, message. And that's a great question. Why do they do that? Yeah, great question again. Um, so because the woodchuck eat on grasses and in winter, there's no grasses uh, mm -hmm. outside. So uh, it has to survive on its fat reserve. And to do that, it has to slow his metabolism is very, very, very low. So he's, he has the physiological ability of doing that. And so that's why the heartbeat rate goes very low and the body temperature goes very low too. So it's to um, help, it, help him to survive on his fat reserve. Yeah. Okay. So he's, he's being energy efficient. Absolutely. Great. Um, thanks for that question, Milo. And I know we have another video from Matthew. With the snow coming and the cold weather, how do animals find food in the winter? Yeah, super question. I mean, it's too cold for berry season and a lot of the food's got to be covered by snow. So what do they do? Uh, yeah, actually, it depends on the uh, the food the the species use. So if we if we talk about the downy woodpecker, downy woodpecker, it's no big deal for him because the food is on the bark, or the tree's bark. Right. Uh, if we talk about the gray squirrel, his strategy would be actually to hide food um, during the summer and fall and foraging for that those little cash they had put everywhere uh, during uh, winter to get that food back. And also, we can say if we think about the uh, the little rabbit, the eastern cottontail that mm -hmm. we have in our cities. Well, that species will eat on twigs and branches that they don't do during summer. So they will um, just change their diet during winter. Okay, and so animals are changing their diet. They're also yeah. storing food and yeah. and hiding it away yeah. and digging. Okay. Lots of answers there. Yeah. Um, all these different, they're, they're crafty, this urban wildlife. Well, yeah, yeah. Um, Matthew, thanks very much for the question, as well as Milo and Kara. Uh, Steve, I've got one question here in the chat that I want to ask you, because I know in, in other episodes of Wildlife Wednesday, we've talked about um, something called invasive species. So species yeah. that are moving into a new area where they haven't belonged before. And so Ryan asks a question about the downy woodpeckers, and he wonders, would they eat emerald ash borer larva and ash trees? And can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Actually, um, most of the woodpeckers would do that because that larva is not far under the bark. Mm -hmm. So if the tree is all the way, uh, already a little dead, bark partly dead, it's easier for the woodpecker to go through uh, to go behind the bark. So for sure, the downy woodpecker would eat um, those larva. But uh, if the tree is still healthy and the, and the larva is too uh, well hidden uh, wow. in the tree, that's going to be tough for the woodpecker to get it. So uh, it will eat some of them for sure. Ooh, so it's almost when the damage is already done. Yeah. Oh, darn. Yeah. We could have just uh, unleashed yeah. the <laughs> the woodpeckers. woodpeckers. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much for that question, Ryan. Um, a reminder to everybody, if you do have questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Um, and uh, we're, we can, if we don't get to them in this episode, I know that Steve and his team are going to go through and answer your questions afterwards. So you can always check back in. Steve, that's all the questions we have for you. Okay. I want to say, well done. You passed. Yeah, a thanks. plus. <laughs> um, but that's not all the questions that we have because we actually have questions for the audience and it's trivia time. So get ready, everyone. Here comes some trivia. Okay, first question. How many litters can an Eastern gray squirrel have in one year? Okay. Put your answers in the chat. And yeah. I know, Steve, you talked about this. What's a hint for people to jog their memories? Well, actually, it depends on the weather. So mm -hmm. it's different if the winter is very cold or if the winter is milder, it's going to be different. Right. Okay. So if it's milder, more food, maybe, maybe more litters? Maybe. Vicky says two. Carol says two. Baza says two. Jacqueline says two. <laughs> <laughs> Just good hints here. Um, Catherine says one or two. 
maximum of two. So one, I think you said one if it's colder. Yeah. And there's less less food around and two yeah. if, okay, great. Um, good job, everybody. Man, good answers. You guys are all really fast. Okay, next questions coming up. How many skunks can we find in one den in winter? How many skunks? Okay, Steve, what's the hint for us? Well, to keep the heat up in a den, uh, they need to be uh, uh, more than one for sure. More than one, yeah. So lots, they're like a hot water bottle, a skunk hot yeah. water bottle. <laughs> Jason is guessing 20. Clement is guessing 20. Carol guesses 20. This is this is a good crowd. Milo, 21. Catherine, got to keep up the heat with 20. Answer, up to 20. You can't get anything past everybody who's watching today. They're, yeah. they're listening very closely. Well done, team. Well done. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like you said, the skunk hot water bottle, I'm never going to get rid of that image. That's an amazing yeah. image. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. 20s, amazing. Yeah. Next question. What species of woodpecker can be commonly found in wooded urban settings all winter? Okay. What species of woodpecker? So, it's, it's a black and white woodpecker, and white. it's a small one. Okay. It's not very big. Yeah. Um, is it the same woodpecker as Woody the woodpecker? Actually, it's a cousin of it. Okay. It's a cousin? Yeah. Okay. Woody the woodpecker is a real species, right? Yeah, uh, yeah almost. Almost real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got some guesses. Vicky is saying a downy woodpecker. Jacqueline's saying a downy wood. Oh, lots of downy. Get Man, oh. everybody, Jason, downy. It is a downy woodpecker. Excellent. And so yeah. those are the ones eating larva all through the winter, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's good. They're business as usual. They're not hibernating. Exactly. So I think there's some at my bird feeder. I've got a, a fat feeder um, and they, yeah. they come to me. Yeah. Okay. Last one. What species uses his tail as a blanket while waiting for warmer temperatures? Other than my cat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we can say that it's a quite a common common species okay. in our urban area. <clears throat> um, okay. And it's a spe yeah, so a species we can see all year round. And Steve, would we see it in all the cities? You think? Um, most of them, more and more, they are going west. So uh, yeah, we see them in now in pretty much all cities. Okay, Vicky is guessing squirrel, and Jason's guessing gray squirrel. Uh, Mike is saying uh, raccoon, gray squirrel. Nice yeah. work. Big yeah. fluffy tails. Yeah. Big fluffy tails. Um, okay, that, Steve. I think is a wrap. That was pretty yeah. great. I know uh, I'm going to be, like I said, sleeping with visions of squirrels and their cozy tail blankets <laughs> dancing in my head. Yeah. Oh, my hot water bottle. <laughs> well, team, this is the last episode of 2020. Uh, thanks for joining us throughout the year. You've been a wonderful audience. We'll be back on the last Wednesday of January 2021 with Brandon LaForest. And he's going to be talking about barren ground caribou. And barren ground caribou is really another word for reindeer. So the holiday spirit is going to continue with Wildlife Wednesdays into January 2021 as well. And remember, you can tune in every month on the last Wednesday of every month at 4 p.m. Eastern for a new edition of Wildlife Wednesday. Also, if you have any ideas on what animals you'd like to see featured in 2021 or animals in particular areas like today's one on urban wildlife, please Put it in the comments. We read all your comments. Even after the episode, we go back and uh, and make sure we read them. Steve, this was great. Yes, thanks. Yeah. It was fun. <laughs> I'm glad. Thanks for sharing your urban wildlife expertise with us. I know I learned a lot. And I want to thank everybody who's joined us. From all of us at WWF Canada, have a warm and cozy holiday season and happy new year. We'll see you in 2020. <laughs> <laughs>